Hey folks, welcome to this short video on artificial intelligence and machine learning with NAS. A lot of things are happening in this space right now, and I think one of the main concerns is the amount of data going into AI and ML systems. It's your data, and that comes with some challenges for organizations, and there's some ethical challenges, and there's some regulatory challenges. So I'm going to say hey to my peer, colleague, and friend Byron, who's going to join us uh, for hopefully for the next 10 to 15 minutes while we talk about these things. First and foremost, what do you push into your AI and ML that you're worried about? Oh, um, well, coming from a healthcare background, I'm always thinking about uh, healthcare data in general. Um, I know hospitals have regulatory re requirements to uh, protect that data, but if it gets into the cloud, if they're using cloud providers or other providers, it's something to be aware of that they don't have sort of this perimeter security boundary of existing data centers that they own, for example. So that's where my head goes, but you know, I use my mobile device every day. There's all sorts of tracking information and, and whatnot. So it's, it's all over the place. How about you? Yeah. Everything. <laughs> Everything. From talking to my That's AI driven simple. banking app. I need more money. Help me out. That's yeah, a simpler it's, it's answer. Shockingly, yeah. bad. <laughs> shockingly bad. So everything from data acquisition to data processing, we have issues and challenges with, and I think it was bad enough before this, this last wave of AI and ML where even traditional, can I say traditional big data challenges? It was always hard. How do we get the data? How do we process it securely? How do we store it securely? And how do we stop the thing from leaking? And now with everybody doing AI and ML, I think this problem's just gone 100x in terms of magnitudes worse than it was. So I think there's three points on a triangle. Um, we can talk about data safety, we can talk about data sovereignty, and we can talk about data accountability. So if we start off with data safety, can we just maybe touch on some of those things? And then we can also talk about how NATS can solve some of these problems as we discuss them as well. So let's talk about, uh, I guess, data acquisition first and foremost. So as we ingest data from an external system, um, can we talk about how you would use NATS in terms of handling data at the point of ingestion, so doing some processing, uh, and then how we can store that securely as well. Yeah, sure. So there's there's a quite a few factors there, but I think one of the key things with NATS is that if uh, you're collecting data over a NATS connection, you can uh, have MTLS set up between your, your clients and your servers. Uh, there's a very rich authentication and authorization story with NATS and full multi-tenancy available. So you can have complete accounts, account isolation. NATS messages are payload agnostic. So if you opt in to add additional encryption on top of your message payload, you can, you can do that as well. So right out of the gate, NATS gives a, a variety, a spectrum of capabilities to be able to sort of ensure your end-to-end message and data in transit um, between your the client and server, whether it's a publisher or subscriber of, of those data. Hmm. Yes, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good answer, I guess. And then there's all these new trends with the processor vendors out there, they're kind of silicon vendors. They're also looking at how do they divide a CPU up as well. But that's not, it's not gonna be available and it's not always gonna be available. So you look at the number of virtual machines out there, say in an enterprise, or the number, the amount of resources it might consume from a cloud like AWS. I don't think we can rely on hardware to do that. So it goes back to the developer and the developer's responsibility. Yep. And we can say NATS makes a lot of that stuff easier. So the next one then in that triad is data sovereignty. So once we have the data, once we've you know transported it to the system securely, we then put it in rest and it's encrypted when it's resting. Um, how do we make sure it doesn't leak from an area that it's not supposed to be in or even accessed by a threat actor? Sure, yeah. So so with NATS, um, when you're working with data streams in particular, so you're able to, publishers are able to write data into streams, it's storing on disk or in memory. Um, when when data is in disk, you can sort of have that encryption at rest, as you mentioned. But the interesting thing with streams is with NATS is that you have a whole NATS topology that you can actually uh, tag servers with um, based on region, location, some sovereignty, sovereignty label that you, that you choose. It could be a state, it could be a region, what have you. And so there can be an explicit placement of these data streams um, in those, on those particular servers. So all data that's replicated would only exist and reside on those servers and then 
the consumers would only coexist with their streams in those particular um, those particular areas. And so you can kind of guarantee that, you know, subscribers consuming data um, or publishers publishing data into those streams are going to be within that particular uh, locality. Interesting. And I'm going to try and trip you up on this one because this is always a favorite <laughs> one. So that's data at rest and that's where we, we can process the data. We can keep the streams in a region. What's going to stop somebody say, I've got data in the US and I'm in the UK and I'm going to try and access or I'm going to try and subscribe to the data in the US and I'm going to subscribe to those subjects. What kind of controls does NATS have to stop that kind of data flow? Or sure, yeah. So there's there's a couple of things. Um, there's this notion, this sort of high level notion of multi-tenancy. So you can completely isolate streams based on, you know, clients, uh, existing in, in particular regions, particular clusters, US, UK, and then those clients traffic would only flow within the, the assets that they actually have access to within those particular clusters. And so the multi-tenancy feature is part of that solution. And then there's also the actual physical data placement as well um, among, among those, uh, those servers that that account actually has access to. So Nats, does interest graph pruning at, a, at an account level so that traffic is not gonna flow across servers that there is actually no um, access based on that account. And we can also do other things. So the next question <laughs> is how would we stop people from interacting with the account? Right, so so there's a, a so this, this broader term that you might come across with Nats is called decentralized authentication and author, authorization. So. There's a whole trusted chain chain of trust that's that's implemented with Nats. You have this operator, you have accounts, and then you have users as sort of the, the hierarchy there. And so with accounts, you can basically create these accounts with signing keys, scope signing keys, for example, and you can rotate those um, on a regular basis. You can reprovision all of the account, the uh, user credentials and things like that. Um, how, how would you, what, what would you say since you're also thinking about this stuff. <laughs> Ooh, trying to trip me up. That's a good one. It's, it's like a reverse trip up. Got to throw, throw it back. Yeah. So I think we've got all the basic controls. I think authentication and authorization per account is, is fantastic. Um, we can also crank up uh, explicit uh, deny lists, I think, as well on the, on the connections themselves to really try and crank that down and, and stop that from happening. Um, I think it's just being mindful though as well. You know, almost uh, you use decentralized auth, but you also just need some discipline within the teams to make sure they're only accessing what they're supposed to be accessing and they've only requested to access as well what they're supposed to be accessing instead of just give me wildcard everything because I'm special, you know, big yeah. news, you're not. <laughs> and that, <laughs> not where and that, data protection's concerned. Yeah, and that's a great that's a great point. So sort of one of the one of the unspoken heroes of of, uh, uh, of accounts, there's this notion of a scope signing key. And you can even go farther with tagged scope signing keys. And so this is a very interesting model where you can basically create a templated uh, account signing key that you can crank out user credentials um, that are going to be, because of the subject-based addressing in NATS, you can basically isolate all messaging at, at a subject level per user credential. And you can the really nice thing about that is that you can revoke those on demand um, and you can also change the permissions on demand. And once you uh, push up the change to that account, uh, that signing key, basically all of the NATS will propagate all of those changes across all servers where there are client connections under that account and it'll force them to reconnect and any authorization permission changes will, will take full effect. And if you're subscribed to a subject you shouldn't be anymore, it'll basically disconnect your client. So nice. it's pretty, it's pretty nice. Yeah, it's pretty deep, pretty wide. We've got lots of good options. And then the last one, probably the hardest one to talk about is data accountability. So let's say you're an organization, you're acquiring data, you're processing data, some countries require to you to register as a data collector and data processor as well. But what can we do in Nats to ensure that an organization is leaving a paper trail of their activities? Yes, good question. So there's a there's a hand, handful of things there. So um, there's Nats has a whole notion of these sort of event advisory or advisory events, as we call them. So there's this is sort of a system account, as we refer to it, a system level um, thing that can track. It gives a little bit of sort of not not end to end data provenance because that sort of requires some application level insight and knowledge about the data itself. But 
from a system perspective, there's these advisory events that actually get published any time that certain events happen in the system. So that's one area, and you could you could log those out either into a stream if you choose to, and in, in an app stream, you could make this nice sort of recursive thing, or you can log them out into sort of another system um, that you need to retain for a certain period of time. But from an application developer standpoint using NATS, you can very easily create dedicated streams for the purpose of basically audit logging for a lack of a better term. So any processing that you do, any data that you're actually using as part of, a, uh, of, of processing, you can then either write the output as events and use more of an event sourcing type of model. Um, so you have sort of that full audit log if you, if you model your computation that, that way. Um, but you sort of have this, this flexibility and this, um, let's say, range of, of, of things. You have your streams, you have your KV, you have your object store. So you can basically build up your, your own mechanism to be able to, based on your, your organization's requirements, to be able to write out a whole bunch of sort of audit information or provenance information into the into these uh, Nats uh, assets. So that's my answer. How about you? What do you think? <laughs> I've got nothing else to add. I think you, you touched on, I think, all of it. Um, you can use Nats itself to provide a stream. Um, so that's one thing you can write events into that, whether you then grab outputs from the, the Nats server itself with, with the advisories as well. Uh, I think it's, we, we've got some controls we can, we can provide there to provide that audit trail, that really important audit trail. Uh, so when things do go south, you know, we've got something to go back on. What I'd like to do now is just also flip this around a little bit and talk about the developer experience in all of this. So if we take something really popular right now that is using an LLM, a large language model, and the large language models come from OpenAI. We've got um, like Bard. Uh, we've also got, um, I think, MPT from Mosaic ML, uh, Llama. There's some open source uh, LLMs. I think the most famous one right now, most people have heard of this, is we can just talk about ChatGPT from, from OpenAI. So one of those use cases uh, let's, is an interactive chat. What we might do is we might build a prompt. So we, we're going to have a system prompt component. And we're also going to have some chat input. And that typically looks like a list of historic interactions between a user uh, and, and the system. And you might also feed in some additional data. And this is where the risk comes in. So you might feed in the name, a date of birth. You know, we've got PII, we've got, you know, uh, privately individual uh, identifying information that we can feed in. So we've got name, it might even be partial address country of origin and what it does it narrows down your identifying criteria which is a bit, a bit of a risk but also we've got some data problems so is we have interactions these are stateless interactions with an llm yes these things have some kind of you know inbuilt uh, learning window and cycle but largely for the sake of an application interaction the stateless which means we have to store all the interaction state off somewhere else and recall it and 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 you know iteratively as these interactions kind of carry on is rebuild the data and send it in and we also we have to do sliding window style problems as well so i think addressing this stuff what we might have is we might have user data we might have username we might have date of birth we might have you know sexual orientation you know whatever it is a religious alignment who knows uh, and we'll also have chat components so we can use things like the key value store to store the information that regularly gets gets posted into the into the user prompt we might use streams as well for rebuilding the chat conversation so we can do all of these these different things but if we break this down at a high level uh, I'm genuinely of the belief that Nats provides a developer the tools and the features when used correctly to bookend and you know wrap the interactions uh, with an LLM really nicely together so you kind of get this inbuilt security, this inbuilt, uh, I guess, uh, accountability and safety and sovereignty that we've been talking about. Have you got any thoughts on that? Because I realize I just took over there completely. To talk. No, no, it, it, did, it did make me think... Um... And I was going to throw this at you anyway, but this whole notion of, and you sort of summarized it, but maybe in a more terse way, is that because of that's being cloud agnostic, it's suitable and fairly optimized for edge. And it has this suite of capabilities, messaging, streams, KV, object store. And the thing to realize is that that's all built under the exact same security model end to end. So if you're doing request reply services, that's the same security model, same authentication authorization model, whether you're using streams, KV, object store. And so rather than trying to bring together all of these disparate technologies to maybe satisfy those, those various capabilities, and then it's like, how do you hand off, you know, authorization, authentication between these systems? How do you guarantee end-to-end -end security? 
And so it's, it's just one of those things that it's really, a really great tool to be able to address and build systems that need to consider this end to end security and privacy. Yeah, absolutely. And you, you're now making me think as well about some things. So right now, language change or lang chain is probably one of the most popular libraries out there for using an LLM. Uh, and then there's this whole command framework, you know, so the idea is that you could ask an LLM a question. It might come back and say, hey, you don't have the answer for that, but I've got a question. You can go and use this tool to go and get the data back. With something like Nats, you've got as well one data fabric to interact with, with all the security controls over the top to go and get data in real time and not just go and do a database dip, which is kind of interesting, which means your LLM potentially can have real time information coming in to make decisions on things, which are, I find absolutely fascinating, again, from one set of one set of controls. Anyway, any takeaways, Byron, before we before we call time on this? I think uh, you should consider Nats when thinking about this this, this space. Um, it's really well suited. It's really well aligned with a lot of these concerns. Security, in particular, was uh, a very deep design decision. All the design decisions in Nats uh, regarding security was very deliberate, um, and with all of the authorization and permissioning controls that it actually has. It's really with very granular permissions. Um, it's it's uh, something very well suited. How about, how about you, David? <laughs> Just to add on to that, I think with, with all the features with the streaming, um, so having some experience with these LLMs, using a stream for conversational input, really, really valuable key value store, even for last known interaction, we can bundle that up and put it into the key value and then object stores for wrapping up entire conversations or, you know, teams of, of interactions uh, with the LLM. I think given the entire set of features all under the single umbrella of controls and libraries, I think that's a superbly placed for ML and AI workloads. So there we go. There Sounds go. like a fix, doesn't it? Come and listen to this and we're going to sell you that. <laughs> but uh, there we go. So hopefully anybody watching this, we've covered some data safety, we've covered some data sovereignty, and we've covered some data accountability. And also we've talked through an example. Thank you for watching this. If you like this video, click like. We'll do some more. Thanks, Byron, as well, for, for joining us on this one. This is great stuff. We'll catch you next time.